Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. The goal of this podcast is to demystify therapy, what can happen in therapy, and the wide array of conversations you can have in and about therapy. Through personal experiences, guests will talk about therapy, their experiences with it, and how psychology and therapy are present in many places in their lives. With lots of authenticity and a touch of humor, here is your host, Steve Bisson. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Merci beaucoup. And welcome to episode 126 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. If you haven't listened to episode 125 yet, please and go and listen. Liz Kelly was amazing. She has a book that's going to come out in March. Go back and listen. You'll hear more and she'll be back on the show. But this week is my first co-host slash passing on to hosting at least quarterly, if not more, to a good friend of mine who has been on the show a few times, Courtney Romanowski. Um, Courtney is someone that I consider a true friend who has been through the thick and thin of a partial mm-hmm. hospital with me and an IOP, and that's an intensive outpatient program. I was somehow her supervisor. I don't know how that <laughs> happened. Um, but Courtney is someone who has, I always I always thought we, she would be bringing a new dynamic to finding her way through therapy. And she's like, I wonder if I can co-host. I'm like, when do we record? So she came on, right? Like as soon as I could. And she was like, my nerves. I'm like, no nerves. It's just me, you and a guest. Who cares? So Courtney Romanowski, who will be your full host a few times a year. Welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy and welcome as a host. Thank you, Steve. Very nervous and excited to be here. Nothing to be Um, nervous about. (laughs) Uh, no, it's just the three of us and not, not listeners or people watching this video at all. But no. no, no, it's very exciting. Um, and I, I um, appreciate your, your support and willingness to uh, let me give this a try. And um, just hope I do right by you and the podcast and your audience and and everybody. So thank you again. Good news. I can't fire you. So. <laughs> yeah and if this doesn't go well then it's all your fault because it was your idea I, I did not train you properly that's what i will say no exactly exactly poor supervision so who's um, here today courtney so um today we have with us uh audrey albert king uh audrey is a licensed mental health counselor board certified dance movement therapist and certified movement analyst uh, she considers herself a body-centered psychotherapist in private practice um, just going to share. Audrey brings 30 plus years of somatic training and experience into her work. She enjoys working with individuals to listen, reconnect, and trust their bodies to help guide them in their therapeutic journey. In addition, Audrey facilitates dance movement therapy for people living with dementia. She's an adjunct faculty at Lovely University in Cambridge, where she also serves as an off-site BCDMT student supervisor. A lifelong dancer, Audrey is grateful to step into her movement practice daily to sustain a healthy, vital, and meaningful life. Welcome, Audrey. Thank you for being on the podcast with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to have you. Um, so I, I just wanted to share a little bit. Um, as you said, I've been on the podcast a few times and have, have been thrilled that he has welcomed uh expressive arts therapy into the conversation of, of therapy. Um, I too, as you know, am a dance movement therapist. Um, and so I think it was after the last time we recorded, Steve, I had this this grand idea of a sort of spin-off podcast, if you will, of finding your way through expressive arts therapy. Um, just because I know expressive arts therapies are getting better known and a little bit more accessible, at least. Um, but I, I know even just from some of my own clients that there's still some hesitations and questions about what dance therapy is or how to use music therapy. So here, here we are. Um, my hope is to, just as Steve does with his podcast, uh, better demystify what expressive arts therapy is, who can use it, what it can be used for, all of that great stuff. So, um, Andre, as my first guest, um, I'm hoping we can share with folks a little bit more about what dance therapy is. Um, I know it's a it's a, a layered question to ask what what is dance movement therapy because I could ask that to a million different dance therapists and everybody would have their own answer, which is wonderful. Um, but I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about what you do with dance therapy or uh, different paths your career has taken so far. 
Yeah, so I think it's interesting about demystifying dance movement therapy because in the past few years, I would say people especially connect with me because they're interested in trying something new. They're interested in something other than verbal or talk therapy. Either maybe it hasn't worked as well for them or someone has said to them, um, you know, trauma is held in the body. Why don't you seek some more body oriented mm -hmm. therapeutic techniques? Um, somatic therapy has been kind of tossed around lately. Um, and so, or there's a curiosity with mindfulness or bodyfulness, or how else can I use therapeutic practice to help me connect with my body? There's all this talk about mind body connection or integration, mm -hmm. and yet it's all coming from here. So, mm -hmm. what's happening here? And, you know, the body is the history holder, right? We hold our entire life history. In fact, our first couple of years, we only learn through movement, how to turn over, okay. how to stand yeah. up. All our learning is just movement. And mm -hmm. nonverbal communication is 70 to 93% of all communication. So I don't know if you have all had this experience. I know I have. I, I have been in therapy. I've been in talk therapy. And there's times where I don't want to say this thing, like either it's too scary or there's shame, or I think the therapist is going to just run out the door and never come back again. <laughs> or I might say something that I never want to come back again. So um, there's a lot of hesitation sometimes with being able to name a feeling or a thought or not even being able to connect to a feeling or a thought. So sometimes mm -hmm. going in through, I see that the client is has a fist or there's tension in the jaw it might be easier to go in that way. So I've been really surprised that people are connecting me and with me and saying, um, I'm kind of interested in this thing. I'm willing to try it, this, even though there's some hesitancy. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, you being in private practice now, have there been certain types of clients that have gravitated towards movement therapy more? Or um, I know to you, fourth which the um, elderly well, so I think, you know, dance movement therapy with groups and dance movement therapy with individuals to me are two very different things, even mm -hmm. though related. I would say the one thing that is for sure related is, you know, as a body centered psychotherapist, I trust my body to tell me what direction to move in with a client mm -hmm. or group. So even though I might be doing more verbal therapy with an individual client, their language or their movement, their gestures or their postures, right? If someone is feeling a little mm -hmm. depressed, there might be a slight concavity, or mm -hmm. if there's a reluctance to speak, there might be a retreating, or mm -hmm. maybe we call this a gesture posture merger where there's a gesture and a posture happening at the same time. All of that is landing in my body. Language lands in my body. If someone is not breathing, I am not breathing. That's called kinesthetic awareness. And then the dance between us is kinesthetic empathy. I want to feel in my body what the client is sensing. I allow myself to sense or feel what I'm feeling in my body. And that sort of leads us into this kind of nonverbal kinesthetic dance. So I allow myself, you know, without actually knowing, you know, I'm not going to try to assume that I know what they're feeling or I know right. what right. they're going to say because of, because I sent something, but if I'm not breathing, it's a sign for me to go, hold on. <laughs> you know, I yeah. need to take a breath. What, I'm sensing something. Is there something happening? So regardless of I'm working with an individual or a group, I respond partly from my body. My body actually feeds some stuff up my vagus nerve into my brain. And then I'll, then I pause and respond, but working with a group, like with people with dementia, actually dance movement therapy really serves everybody, but people that don't, that have a difficult time retrieving language. Mm -hmm. you know, so giving, giving them an opportunity to use their body to communicate um, so yeah, I facilitate groups with, uh, I've been done this for a long time. It's been a passion of mine to, um, move with people in community who 
connect to movement, to connect to music, who come alive with music from their past, who don't worry about who's picking them up for dinner or, um, you know, straightening up the pillows and drawing the drapes when it's time, when the sun goes down. They're just 100% in their bodies, engaged in purposeful movement, and we're just creating something together in that time. And they're mm-hmm. socially connecting and not isolating. So well, that that's what was just coming to mind for me is, um, you know, I, I, I too sense there's, there's a lot of loneliness uh, with the people that I, I talk with. It is great when, um, and I'll speak for myself, when I can connect with somebody verbally and feel understood, but it's totally different to connect with movement. And be, like you said, in a dance with somebody, whether it's dancing, dancing, or just in a more physical conversation. Um, there, there's a sense of, for me, a more more connected relationship um, that we can't always get just by talking. Yeah, and my hope, I think when you said that, right, my hope is that I think a lot of, for me, a lot of clients, especially trauma, there's this idea for me, like all the re-words come to mind when I talk about dance therapy. It's like reclaiming, reconnecting, renewing, you know, all those Mm re-words and reclaiming feels very important, especially with disassociation and doing what we need to do to stay safe in the moment, re-embody, you know, so if there's a movement dialogue or a dancing dialogue in the body, this idea of reclaiming a relationship with the body through creating a relationship with the therapist, that's intriguing to me. That's something that I look forward to creating in the therapeutic relationship or the therapeutic movement relationship. Yeah, yeah. And something that, so you you offer these groups for people with dementia and then in your private practice with your individual clients, and, and I just want to highlight that it's at least my experience, and I'm wondering if it's yours, um, if I do movement therapy with somebody in a session, it's not the entire session. It's not like they're coming in for a dance class necessarily. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be dance as we see on TV or in shows. It can just be this, this breathing, uh, sensing, like you were saying, posture, gesture. Uh, exploration, um, as well as talking, maybe. And then there may be sessions where it is more movement-based. Um, but what, and again, I know it's a layered question, but what, if I were to come to you as an individual client for my first movement session, how how could you introduce me to movement therapy? Well, usually in the consultation, you know, my style or what theories I use or um, my, you know, what has worked for them in the past, what hasn't worked for them, the conversation will come up that we might engage in. It is an invitation only modality. And, you know, I can see right away how people are relating to that invitation on a body level, on a facial gesture level. But, you know, for me, it's really subtle. I mean, there are some times where Uh, a client will come in and they'll ask for some music. Like they just want to like drop it and, you know, just take a minute, like you know, (laughs) that's kind of fun. We'll rock out. Or sometimes, you know, people just need like, you know, just like a moment to drop in to the body Mm. or breath practice. But I try really, you know, my hand goes to my heart. I might take a breath. I am a, a body centered person. I might need to ground. They might see me put my feet on the floor and find my sit bones. And, um, you know, and I might invite them to just you know, maybe put your hand on your heart or press soften here. Mm-hmm. You know, I might close my eyes, invite them to close their eyes. So I'm already very body centered um, in my own way of being a Mm. therapist. So that creates a familiar, possibly, I don't like to say safe space. One of my students uh, two summers ago brought in a comfort space and I really like that. Oh, I love that. Comfort space. And, you know, so, and then again, I try to pick up on, I notice there's a fist or, Um, Is it okay if 
I make a fist or if that fist could talk. So it's not, it's, it's mm -hmm. a subtle process of inviting the body into the session. And like, you know, yeah. And if it's not comfortable for the client, we don't go there, but I'm still very much engaged in my body mm -hmm. and yeah, working it's... toward integration and also working toward integration for, for them somatically. Yeah, I loved what you said, the invitation of welcoming movement into the session. As yeah, and also this trying, is what we're doing. Yeah, and trying to create a sense of like what's happening under the interoceptive sense, like what's happening, what's happening in your body? Like, can you sense because, you know, that sense of everything under the skin, what's happening in the body is something that some people might really um, not have cultivated in a long time and I don't know if you all can but I can't think of a mental health diagnosis that doesn't have a somatic component or any any yeah. symptoms that occur in the body right absolutely so um being aware of you know what what does anxiety feel like for you in the body and then you know my hope is to help co-regulate people's nervous systems mm -hmm. also in the mm -hmm. session I, I feel that that's really helpful so that people can learn to help regulate so it doesn't feel as scary to talk about trauma can mm -hmm. I interject mm -hmm. here for a second uh, sure. one of the things I like yeah. to do is educate people yeah so I I love co-regulate and I love that word and I've used it myself but for those of us who are not familiar with co-regulate what does that mean just, well, in terms of education, really um, uh, helping people to understand that, first of all, what's happening in their body is totally normal and that their autonomic nervous system is really trying to protect them, right? So I often use polyvagal theory. I think it's really um, easy for people to understand that, you know, they go into a, something we call mobilization, which is the beginning of threat where they want to run and then going into sort of dorsal vagal shut down modes of what their body um, needs to do to uh, protect themselves. And, you know, how to, what, what things are going to, what interventions are going to work to help them get back sort of online. And for me personally, you know, and I think there's a place for cognitive behavioral therapy and there's embodied cognitive behavioral therapy. And I think it does work. And uh, reframing is really, really helpful. But in those moments, um, you know, using touch to, you know, uh, release um, endorphins and mm -hmm. oxytocin to counteract the cortisol and the adrenaline using certain methods from polyvagal. The Amber Gray, I'm a big fan of Amber Gray's work. She is a polyvagal informed dance movement therapist, um, sensory motor, Peter Levine's work. You know, he has all these under over here, pressing here, a lot of breath techniques that massage the vagus nerve. Um, for me, they help regulate my nervous system a little bit quicker in addition to um, reframing and, so, and which is available for not just folks who have experienced trauma right but, but for anyone, anyone any one of us social anxiety thoughts that are intrusive and uncomfortable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i um i've had uh, a few of my own clients who have um tried to negate their their own trauma because it isn't what what trauma is, you know, I haven't been to war, I haven't experienced abuse, but your trauma is in the body, right? You're experiencing it. It's just a fifty-five yeah, no. thing, but Very but good. really, even even with uh, and depressive symptoms, like you said, there is no diagnosis really, and not that we always have to work off of diagnoses, but our body is so much a part of. Um, our, our health, our mental health, our emotional health. Um, so it does at least make sense to us. And hopefully we are helping to spread the word a little bit more that movement, body centered therapy um, is valuable. And Courtney, when you just said movement, I 
you know, for me, moving, moving stuck stuff out of the body is really important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, moving it through, even if, you know, like, even if the emotion comes back instantaneously, we understand we can move it through. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's where, for Mm -hmm. me, the dynamics of movement and my movement practice every day is essential. Um, And it it doesn't mean that it has to be like, you know, happy movement. (laughs) It can be like, I hug muscle to bone and, oh, that feels like, you know, grief or whatever, but I'm moving it through. I don't necessarily have to know what's happening. I'm just moving it through or um, (laughs) I'm getting it out. (laughs) And so that's why I engage in uh, Nia technique that practices is Mm. every day. I move all emotions and dynamics like through my body and they might, like I said, like thoughts, right? That you have them, you name them, they, you, however you do it. I like to attach mine to that helicopter, like that has that tagline that says, like, you know, play a make or all you could eat or whatever. <laughs> and you kind of yeah. watch it go across uh, the beach and then it will come back mm-hmm. through or the clouds or however. For me, I like to just move it out of my body. Okay. I think uh, that uh, I, you I, if you don't mind me saying, one of the things that I love that, you know, even for me, who has Courtney as a friend, has had dance movement expressive therapists on before, one of the important messages that I want to repeat, because it's worth saying, is that, you know, to do DMT dance movement therapy, you don't need to be always happy, go lucky and anything like that. So I think this is a great myth to debunk. And I wanted to throw that out because I thought that was a very, very important part is that it doesn't have to be happy. It can be other stuff just to get it out. Like you said, squeezing the muscle and releasing it is such a great thing for most people to do. So sorry to intervene again, but just wanted to mention no, that for no. the Steve, what you say is so important because I would not, that, you know, I'm not, that's a fleeting emotion for me sometimes. So, you know, that's, um, that is really important, you know, mm. I mean, and actually, that. Oh, okay. sorry, Audrey. No, keep going. Keep going. No, just you know, I think that that's also like a misunderstanding about dance movement therapy is that you know I'm not saying that that's that release is what dance movement therapy is. You know, dance movement therapy does further all psychotherapeutic goals, cognitively, socially, emotionally, um, in every way. Um, and, and when people go into therapy, it can be a hard, long road before it gets better for sure, just like that. But dance, often when we say the word dance, it's, you know, like your favorite move at a club or something like that. But whether it's, you're right, whether it's tender, whether it's hard, whether it's agonizing. In, uh, in Nia, there's one move, there's 52 moves, there's one move called a claw hand. I do love claw hand. I'm shredding in it. <laughs> Please go to YouTube to see that one. <laughs> you know, just expressing that and, and being tender and being small and, and confined and all of those things because they're part of the human condition. And you got to feel it. Also, um, no, there's also room for stillness. Beautiful. In yeah. movement therapy. You know, and that that's an important aspect too to explore, um, because um, you know, as we learned as dance movement therapists, even with stillness, there is movement. So we can't disqualify practicing that and and being with somebody to explore that stillness. Yeah, that brings up the felt sense, which is that interoception, that really important sense that we don't really learn about is the felt sense of of stillness, which brings up tolerating, mm-hmm. which is such mm-hmm. important when you look at DBT or whatever that is, is can I tolerate, you mm-hmm. know, when we're still thoughts come in. And that's one of the reasons why people are moving and busy. and Busy, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Still. There's a, a psychotherapist uh, in New York City. Her name is Lori Lynn Meter. And I was attending a, a workshop with her and one of the things she said is, can I be with myself and can I be with you? And can we just mm-hmm. be still? And that's part of that therapeutic relationship is, can I just be still with you? Can I be in my body 
while you are in your body? And can we just hold that space? So just, yeah, another maybe debunking, as, as Steve said, of like, it's not always about moving. Um, but that reconnection, to use the, the rewords again, that uh, reconnecting with, with the body, with the self, and that tolerating of what's going on. Because the wonderful thing that comes from the felt sense is, is there an image in the body for this sense or this whatever is happening when you are still? Is there an image that we can work with that comes out of the body? Mm -hmm. Imagery is so rich to work with because in dance movement therapy, we're looking to derive meaning from the movement or meaning from mm -hmm. anything that's happening in the body almost like decoding and, and again i want to throw out to to folks in case there's maybe still some questions it's not about um you know we hear or at least me as a dancer have heard the you know be a tree in modern dance right like we're not we're not doing that type of image work but really what's just what's coming up for you um you would lose me right away if you told me to be a tree <laughs> what would you like to be steve would you like to be a I'm still learning. Give me a chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but again, just, um, I don't know, for me, it feels important that folks aren't thinking dance class or even, uh, yes, yoga can be pulled in or, you know, whatever the practitioner's background is, it is, can be brought in to the session, but it is more about, like Audrey is saying, a better understanding and putting, uh, what did you say, decoding, Audrey? Um, including being a detective like what what yeah. can the body the body like the body is the history holder right of our entire mm -hmm. life so the body holds the truth when the brain doesn't always mm -hmm. I don't know about you but I have really twisted a lot of uh truths around mm -hmm. and um internalized things and been conditioned in various ways um mm -hmm. in various mm -hmm. environments and for me you know just for me uh in our patriarchal capitalistic socio-cultural political world you know mm -hmm. um but the truth the truth lies mm -hmm. here and so being able to tap into the wisdom of the body is helpful yeah and that's that you know that carries outside of the session too, they, I, some of my own clients have noticed, like, oh, like a couple days after we met, I noticed this in my body, and I was like able to take care. I was able to breathe a little bit more, um, or open, stand up a little bit taller. And even if they're like, and then the next day was crap, there was still this moment of recognizing a, a change, or or just a more awareness or a, ability to take care of oneself. Yeah, or the pattern. Like the pattern. I, yeah. I felt choked when this happened and I wanted to speak. I felt choked. I noticed I had to go in the other room and shake my hands and shake my hands and shake my hands. Or I noticed this, I noticed that. Because in my experience, I'm not wanting to rid some of the these things that I don't see anything as necessarily a problem unless it really interferes with functioning i want to integrate it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? mm -hmm. can you say more about that integrating part well you know like for example um right stimming like working with parents like that is a necessary behavior as as, as far as i'm concerned you know um can you just uh, what what is that the, uh, hand movements um, in order to cope with a task or an environment, um, leg shaking, mm -hmm. things like that, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think are really important. They help with coping, you know. Yeah, of, oftentimes they're seen as something that needs to be stopped, whereas you're talking about integrating it yeah, and using it. Um, I just want to go back a bit. You mentioned Mia, um, which I know is a big part of your life, but um, can you share a little bit of what Mia is? and how you use it for yourself mm. it's um a, a life practice it's actually 40 years old today it was founded by oh, debbie happy um it's a global uh 
practice. It's a technique. There's um, like codified moves, but it's not really about learning the moves. It's about sensing in your body. So it's not about getting them right. There are like base moves, core moves, upper extremity moves. And um, as an older mover, what I'm appreciating is they're really like based on the body's way. So when you take a step forward, you lead with the heel. When you take a step back, you are on the ball of the foot. When you step to the side, you're on the whole foot. So it really works off the intelligence of the body's way. So for me, I dance every day. I have not been injured. Um, mm -hmm. I also, you know, I step into the practice. The cycle one is a step in and I just say, hello, body. You know, like, what do you have to tell me today? It's you get invitations from the instructor, spiritual realm, emotional, physical, uh, cognitive imagery, and you find out what's happening inside and you get to express yourself. And mm. again, the teacher might be doing something and I might set something in my body and I'll do it my way. And I it feel really great is. afterwards. Um... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it really is wonderful. I, I've taken a few classes with you, and it's it's fun and, like you said, expressive. Um, I felt a lot of relief for myself and strength that I haven't, uh, not just physical strength, but emotional strength that I hadn't felt in a while. So it really is a wonderful experience. Um, and and you don't have to so, know how to dance, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and yet different from what I mean, a dance therapy session or whatever you want to you know is right. So there's yet still very important. Yeah, more therapeutic. Um, more therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And so you know there's you know we are inviting folks to learn more about dance therapy in a therapy session. There are other ways to experience therapeutic movement in one's life, though. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, cultural dance is healing and um, community dance, you know, any, any, I mean, dance is, is the oldest healing art, mm -hmm. oldest way of healing. And even, you know, I, Steve, I remember you mentioning you, and I know this for a fact, because we're in the office together uh, a couple of days a week, um, walking with someone can also be extremely therapeutic and, and valuable. Right. And I, I definitely do that with a, a lot of my clients and they find it a lot more stimulating to be outside the office in, mm -hmm. instead of inside. And, you know, I want to just go back on one single thing and I'll, again, I, I just in, like interrupting here and there. Mm -hmm. One of the things I remind people is that you can go to, there's a tribe out, uh, it's an island off of India who's never been contacted by the westernized culture. They mm -hmm. have dance and they have music. You go to any urban area, whatever urban area you want to talk about across the world, they have music and they have dance. And I kind of remind people that that's the basic stuff for even communication, for letting go. And there's a lot of like therapeutic value into that. So just want to throw in my little converse, my little part of this conversation. Well, you're right. I mean, you know, healing is best done in community, right? Community is the antidote for all, for all that ails you really. I mean, mm -hmm. isolation increases any any illness, right? Any any community mm -hmm. is the antidote. And you know, being in community and moving to rhythm, rhythm is cohesive. Rhythm is going to unite. And you know, I think that we are not meant to grieve alone. We are not meant to go through any of these things alone and um, healing in community. I mean, that's what ritual is for, right? And ceremony and marking passage. And, um, you know, the first thing we ever, ever hear or sense in our own bodies is heartbeat, mm -hmm. which is rhythmic, right? So being in rhythm and dancing, it's very primal. Yeah, it's the most natural thing really for all of us. And it, it saddens me that we've lost that. It's, it's 
more easy or common for a lot of us to be alone. Like I was saying earlier about loneliness being um, such an epidemic right now. And walking with a client, walking in general, you know, the definition of movement is change. And therapy mm-hmm. is about change. Therapy is about transformation. Mm-hmm. And I also mm-hmm. think that when you talk about that, sorry to interrupt again. No um, you know, I think that when you talk about loneliness, one of the, what I hear from people anyway, is, well, I'm an introvert. I need to be alone. And I say, well, singularly being alone is wrong. Singularly just spending time with other people is also wrong. It's kind of a, you know, some people need more people. Some people need less. So isolation is sometimes excused as I'm an introvert. Mm-hmm. And I kind of remind people that you can be an introvert. I'm an introvert. Most people don't believe me, but I truly am an introvert. But, mm-hmm. you know, I do go see people. I do talk in groups and I do enjoy that. But I know I need to resource myself after that. So it's important to think about community as part of who we are and as a whole and not just going community or isolation and finding the middle. Sorry to put in my CBT a little bit here, but. No, I yeah, mean, how dare you, you know, in in movement in movement analysis, um, we have uh, a theme called exertion recuperation. In DBT, it's opposite action, right? So, you know, and again, there is a spectrum, right? It's, you're right; it's not all or nothing. Um, yes, we need that that dance, that change, that movement to really take care of ourselves. So, Audrey, would you mind if I ask? If you have used DMT for yourself, if movement therapy has been part of your experience, yeah, it sure has. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not really sure um, where I would be without it. I stumbled upon it just per chance. I was in my own treatment, and the art therapist said, "Hey, Audrey, you've danced your whole life, and you know, you've had these issues, and you know, have you ever?" Uh, considered dance movement therapy and I was like what like I had the full Oprah aha moment like church bells (laughs) choir like what and you know she you know told me about Leslie University and I like couldn't wait to go to the open house and um, I'm 46 years old I already have a master have you know I'm 46 years old And, you know, I go to the open house and they're talking about using movement and art and all these things to heal and my body's going, you know, and then they pair you up with someone and the person I'm talking to, you know, she's talking about Wicked the Musical and the whole way there, I had it in my car because of my daughter. Like we, you know, we had to do hairspray intervention to get her off Wicked. And so (laughs) right away, I'm like, I have like this best friend who we're bonded with and I'm like, look at that like what that's crazy you know and my husband had said you know like you need to find a different job and like I ran to the car and I like put everybody on speakerphone and I'm like going back to school yeah yeah (laughs) immediately and you know there's some people who you know there's a lot of reflection that one does going through uh expressive therapy dance movement therapy program and the first papers I began to receive back I was oh my God, this person sees me like, they're almost like welcoming my flaws. They're almost like telling me I need to be in the world because I am, I don't know, not okay. They're almost, I felt a welcoming. There was nothing I had to prove. I could start unveiling all Mm -hmm. the stuff that I had worked my whole life to put there. There was a disarmoring. And the more I took a risk. And the more I disarmored, the more, I don't know what happened, but I began to transform. And then I was like, I'm going to see a dance movement therapist. Like there's something here. And my life a hundred percent changed a hundred percent. I began to build a new relationship to my body. Mm -hmm. There was something Mm -hmm. called self-compassion that before any of the buzz self-compassion stuff came out, there was a a forgiving of myself there was oh this critic can actually like be quieted like there's something called self-love like is that a real thing 
So Mm -hmm. everything really changed. And I thought people need to know about this. People need to know that they're okay, that they don't have to work so hard to try to fix themselves. Like there's actually nothing to fix. Like I need to share this knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's okay to go in and in and in and not try to stay out here. Yeah. Yeah. And coincidentally in my movement, in, in understanding what I was learning, I was like, why am I so comfortable out here? And every time I tried to come in here, there was like no room for myself. And I'm like, oh, there's no room. <laughs> I like to be out here. So, you know, the things that one can learn through movement and metaphor are, there's like no going back for me mm-hmm. once I went in. And mm-hmm. Jennifer Tantia in her paper about uh, somatic intelligence talks about the body being the bridge between the conscious and the unconscious. And so, for me, learning things through my body, bottom up versus top down, was like, I could spend a hundred years and never really get it yeah. the way I get it. Mm-hmm. And therefore navigating change and transformation to healing became easier. Yeah, I, you know, I just, even just from, uh, from school, uh, moving in class, my tendency movement wise is to be quick but what is called in um movement uh quick and direct right which also tends to be how i interact with folks quick and direct let's go let's go um and so it's it's been an exploration for me to slow down not just in movement but in in trying to talk a little bit slower and 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 not because it's better for me to do that but because it's just it could open me up and it could give me a different experience. Um, there are times to be quick and direct. There are times to you know, slow down a little bit and explore indirectly what is going on around me. Um, so movement jargon, but it does. There the patterns of what our body is doing and what we how we are relating to one another, how we're relating to ourselves, how we're moving through the world. Um, it it all connects. And yeah, it's great that you say that because the thing about, again, about integration, about patterns is we, is, is it, it brings us to the world of choice, which is what mm-hmm. I hope to pro- help provide my clients with this option, this, this yielding, this, right? Like, so we can, this awareness that you talked about before, we can lean into our patterns and choices we can decide we want to expand them. Sometimes they can be limiting. Sometimes they can be protecting. Sometimes they can be comforting. Or sometimes we can choose to go out there and they know this is not serving me right now. I want to expand. I want to, you know, and this brings us into, can bring us into biases and all these things of, of, right. of yeah. how these don't necessarily serve us as a therapist for all of our clients and that's a whole other conversation, but really important and fascinating, but Mm -hmm. patterns, conditioning, choice, awareness. Yeah. And, and I, now when I make a referral to Courtney, I'm going to describe you as quick and direct, but also kind. Um, I think that could be a good (laughs) tagline right there. Um, (laughs) Just why I throw that up. Yeah, the, it, was, it came to me because I was quoting Amber Gray before is that she has this quote. I might not get it exactly right, but it's something like everybody deserves to live in a peaceable body or no, everybody deserves to live in their body in the way they see fit. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that that's one of the things that we strive to do is help people make that an accessible thing. And I don't want to be interrupting, but we've had so much fun. We're getting close to the hour already. So, you know, I, I'll, let, I'll let you complete the interview, Courtney. But, you know, to help you out here, like we're going already close to an hour. It went by really fast. Really, really did. This has been wonderful. Andre, um, I think my maybe we could wrap up with how do you want to encourage folks to maybe think about dance movement therapy as, a, as an option for them? Well, I think this idea of living in a peaceable body, you know, not having peace in the mind, whatever that means, living with discomfort, living with ease, not being able to completely function. And it doesn't have to be dysfunction, just not functioning in the way 
one would desire. What is living in this a peaceable body? You know, the mind is in the body. <laughs> so, you know, um, Christine Caldwell wrote a book called Bodyful. This idea of bodyful versus mindful, dare I say? I don't know. I don't know what I'm creating out in terms of people outside. <laughs> what is she saying? But this idea of being bodyful, mm. this idea of creating relationship with the body and living peaceably with one self cannot be done from here. If there's an mm. interest and in, oh, this is this is a yucky feeling in my body, or my heart's racing, or I want to retreat, I want to hide, I don't want to be in this situation, or every time I go to say this, this happens in my body, be curious. And there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong, there's nothing to fix, but be curious mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. these things. It's, you know, the body can be a scary place for a lot of us, but curiosity helps. Wonderful invitation to spend some folks. Um, and there is a website, the American Dance Therapy Association, um, adta.org, I believe, um, that has a database uh, if folks want to look up their nearest dance movement therapist. And there are also videos as to what DMT is and other resources on the website. Audrey, is there a way for folks to reach you if they're interested? I mean, they can also put in dance movement therapy and psychology today too, which okay. is mm -hmm. important. I'm at info at audreyalbertking.com. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, thank you again very, very much. I always love talking with you. Um, a lot of great info. Um, hopefully we are on our way to demystifying dance movement therapy and uh, the other expressive modalities. Hey, first, First episode of a, a guest host down. Uh, thank you very, very much. Feeling lighter today already. Well, I want to thank you, Audrey and Courtney. You did a wonderful job. So I can't wait to have you do this all on your own and me not interrupting <laughs> constantly. Thank you so much, Audrey. And, um, you know, hopefully people will go and reach out and, you know, the education was so important for everyone. So this completes episode 126 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. For episode 127, we are going to have Hayden Duggan, who is the director of OnSite, which is a place in Massachusetts to help firefighter police, EMTs, paramedics to get treatment in a mm -hmm. uh, intensive outpatient format, which is really beneficial. And I hope you join me then. Please like, subscribe, and follow this podcast on your favorite platform. A glowing review is always helpful. And as a reminder... This podcast is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. If you're struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue, please reach out to a professional counselor for consultation. If you are in a mental health crisis, call 988 for assistance. This number is available in the United States.